the topic of global citizenship is something that has evolved over time. And when we think of teaching global citizenship, we are when we used to think of teaching global citizenship, we now think of teaching for global citizenship. And um, I'd like to begin with the land acknowledgement. Although I am not currently at the University of Alberta, I am sitting in my home. Um, I am, I guess, a member of the University of Alberta, and I would like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta is on uh, Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Um, what I hope that we can do today um, is fivefold. First, I'd like to go uh, through um, what different authors and different groups have called what uh, the term global citizenship. Uh, then I would like to look at what do we teach to help children become global citizens, look at some examples of global citizen projects, adapt these to the heritage language context, and then hopefully there will be some time for sharing discussion, questions and answers. So let's begin with the question of what is global citizenship? And uh, the word citizen, many of you may know, be, uh, comes from the word cite, which means people working together for a better place for all. So it sounds a lot like a city, which would fit, but I think that we're talking about citizenship belonging to larger and larger groups. So um, a, a farmer working on his or her field is still a part of a larger collective. And that farmer going to a local village and sharing uh, resources with that local village is also a part of a larger group. And a, a community uh, that grows from a village to a town to a city and many cities begin to amalgamate to become a province uh, are also part of this notion of citizenship. So we look at the idea that we all want to live in a good world and to do so we all have to be able to care about that world and how it impacts other people. So the notion of global citizenship now moves to being um, seeing oneself as a member of humanity and also thinking about everyone in the world. Thus, global citizens try to understand other people and have empathy for them. Global citizens act fairly in their choices, their decisions, and their words. Global citizens believe that they are just as important as everyone else. Global citizens believe that all people are equal. Global citizens recognize global issues such as extreme poverty, climate change, gender inequality, and more. They care about and contribute to global solutions, and they expect the same from their leaders. Global citizenship could be seen as a choice and a way of thinking, as self-awareness and awareness of others, as the practice of cultural empathy, as the cultivation or learning of principled decision-making, as the social and political life of one's community. Let's look at each of these points a little more closely. So global citizenship as a choice and a way of thinking. Well, when we think of national citizenship, it is in a way an accident of birth. That is that you were born on a certain territory. Global citizenship is different. It is in fact a voluntary association. And it means ways of thinking and living recognizing that you are a member of cities, regions, states, nations, international collectives. People come to consider themselves as global citizens through different formative life experiences and interpret those. So formative life experiences means initially those experiences of the home, 
with family, friends, neighbors, also with religious institutions, can be also in community schools or daycare, and eventually public schools. How do these people engage in global issues or with different cultures in a local setting, all influence those initial formative life experiences and how broad your view might be. For many, or I should say for others, global citizenship can mean firsthand experience with different countries, peoples, and cultures. So traveling is often uh, a way of helping people to build their understanding of this interconnectivity of people and resources on the planet. But for everyone, it really means that blend of acting, thinking, understanding the global and linking it to the local. As we become adults, each individual makes a choice in whether or how to practice this global citizenship. Global citizenship is also self-awareness and the awareness of others. Well, of course, self-awareness begins both locally and with the self. It helps students or children in a family to identify with the commonalities or the universalities of human experience. For example, coming to understand that everyone needs food, shelter, love, belonging. Everyone needs friends. They, everyone has a language for communication. It helps people better identify with fellow human beings and their sense of responsibility toward them. How can I help others who are less fortunate than I? In other words, it helps you to understand your privilege. Global citizenship is also the practice of cultural empathy. Cultural empathy is, has become another word for intercultural competency. And it is often considered a goal of global education. Intercultural competency is seen as an important skill, for example, in the workplace. Cultural empathy helps people see questions from multiple perspectives and move comfortably among cultures. And those cultures can be anything from a workplace culture to a home culture, to a friendship culture, to another, uh, to a culture in another community or in another country. Cultural empathy gives people awareness of their own multiple cultural identities. And it gives them confidence to experience, or at least not be afraid to experience, unfamiliar cultures. Global citizenship as the cultivation of principal decision making means that first we have to become aware that we are interdependent people and interdependent nations. For example, the water of a river or a lake doesn't actually stop at a political boundary and flow in one direction in one country and another in another. The air that we breathe continues to flow around our planet and is not one way in one country and another way in another country. By becoming aware of these kinds of systems, the water system, the air system, or the system of businesses or companies that function in the world, we can develop a greater sense of responsibility for these different functions. Global citizenship then means making ethical choices through researching something before you make a purchase or before you commit to helping a group and making principled decision making. Some examples, learn about the stuff that you're going to buy. Where was it made? Was it, did it involve child labor? These are the questions that global citizens asked. Travel sustainably. Are you uh, overextending your carbon footprint? In recent years, I have organized about 10 national and international 
online conferences. And these online conferences, much like this um, interaction today, are always to reduce the carbon footprint. Of course, in some ways, they're not as much fun. If we were all able to meet together, there are many things we would be able to do that we couldn't do if we met locally and connected only through the internet with people elsewhere. Nevertheless, we must be thinking about the damage that overuse of certain forms of travel cause our planet. Volunteering locally, giving of your time to help causes that are less fortunate, whether that's the food bank, uh, help, helping us in a senior's home or uh, volunteering with your language skills at um, an international or national event. Donate smartly. In other words, you might look first at the cause, but you might also research the organization to ensure that your donation goes to the right uh, or as much of your day, no, donation as possible goes to the source that you believe that you are donating to. It means reading everything you can about whatever you're exploring. Global citizenship as participation in the social and political life of one's community can mean, first of all, defining different communities, lo local, global, religious, educational, there are, in fact, many types of communities. But global citizens feel not only the connection to their communities, but the desire to participate in them. So you can buy a membership in different groups, and that's one form of support. But another desire is that you are more active in your participation. So this could mean not just knowing that we should be using less or no plastic bags, but actually making a conscious effort not to use them. Um, voting, volunteering, advocacy, and activism. So participation is what would be considered the action dimension of global citizenship, not just the feeling or the thinking, but the actual action. So what do we teach in order to help children become global citizens? Well, culture, environmental integrity, rights, roles, and responsibilities, and human rights. But a little bit more concretely, one way or one starting point would be to look at uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, some of you may have heard of them, some of you may not. Let's begin by asking you, how many are there? Anyone want to guess? And I'm sorry I can't see, but I'll tell you, there are 17. What are they? And so we're going to look at each of these 17, and this will go fairly quickly. Um, and what I would, if, if we were doing an interactive session or had been able to break into meeting rooms, I would have asked you to jot down uh, initially a few that you think you would recognize, and then to discuss with some people in a group what are what you imagine these sustainable development goals to be. But since we can't do that, you can be thinking about them in your mind, and I'll go through what they are. So number one is no poverty. So a sustainable goal is the elimination of poverty. Number two, that there be zero hunger in the world. Number three, good health and well-being of everyone in the world. Number four, that we all have opportunities for quality education. Five, that there is gender equality. Six, that there is clean water and sanitation for everyone. Seven, that there is affordable and clean energy for everyone. Eight, that there is decent work and economic growth 
for everyone. Nine, that there is industry, innovation, and the building of infrastructure that supports everyone no matter where they live. 10, that there is a reduction of inequalities on all in all of these areas. 11, that we live in sustainable cities and communities. And sustainable means uh, includes the use of our energy, uh, how what our public transportation systems are like, um, access to the uh, healthy foods, for example. We're now on number 13, which is climate action. Number 14 is life below water. Uh, number 15 is life on land. Number 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And number 17 is partnerships for the goals. Um, so what I would like to ask you to think about now is how can these goals become part of the content of the Heritage Language Program? How can they become part of the way the school is run? And so for a minute, before I move on, jot down a couple of ideas that you have relating to these 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals about how you think you could bring them into your school or your classroom. And here are a few ideas that I have to offer. And again, this, these, this is, um, these are only a few, and there are many, many, many more that could be included, and many better ones. So, for example, um, how we treat the boys and girls and non-gendered roles within our schools. Um, healthy snacks, um, collaborating with other groups, whether that's within our heritage language community or with other communities. Learning about nature through the heritage language program, you're respecting it. Managing the school's waste responsibly. Rules for responsible behavior and fairness. Um, drink water at school, but don't waste it. I know many times when um, I visit schools, you can see children around the water fountain, and sometimes that uh, becomes a little bit of a, a water play, but thinking about not wasting that. Uh, respect for instructors and reasonable compensation to the instructors. And how do those fit? Well, as you can see, um, they fit with the different sustainable development goals. Now, how can a teacher or parent prepare students to contribute positively to local, national, and global communities is another aspect of global citizenship. Um, in um, a previous talk uh, or session for ELA relating to global citizenship, I drew on research that describes three types of citizens, personally responsible, participatory, and justice-oriented. And I think that as we've moved to global citizenship, this was work based on um, an, a very important study in 2004 um, that evolved into uh, a little bit more detail. But as we now look at global citizenship, I think you can see that all of these aspects of um, a personally responsible citizen, such as you work, you obey the laws, you recycle, maybe you give blood, you volunteer, um, fit with a global citizen. Uh, are you a participatory citizen? Are you an active member of community organizations? Do you help organize activities in times of need? Do you know how government agencies work and draw upon them when necessary? Are you a justice-oriented citizen? That means, are you making fair choices? Are you considering the ethical dimension 
of any of the purchases that you make. I want to let you all know that Alberta is uh, not so new anymore, but curriculum embeds ethical citizenship and global responsibility, as you can see. With the student at the center, with literacy and numeracy being uh, primary goals, uh, in addition to critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, creativity and innovation, social, cultural, global and environmental responsibility, uh, developing good communication skills, digital and technological literacy, and recognizing lifelong learning, personal management and well-being, as well as the ability to collaborate and lead. What we have are um, ethical citizens that can engage and recognize interconnections of all the systems I've mentioned earlier and more. Now, what are a few examples of how we might apply this to the heritage language classroom? Well, the first and most important thing to remember is that heritage language classrooms are a combination of learning language and using language, and perhaps maintaining language. And in that way, we are always seeing language as a tool. It is a tool for learning, a tool for creating, for expressing, for explaining, for sharing. And so what we want to look at is projects that students can undertake using their language skills. Um, a number of years ago, after one of these sessions, Trudy, who teaches um, in a Vietnamese heritage language school, brought this to her students. And uh, this is an example uh, that one student wrote or described the ways in which they are um, globally engaged. Now, you'll notice that this is bilingual. So there are points in English, but there are also points in Vietnamese. And for some of these points uh, or some of these tasks, such as uh, creating um, a global citizenship uh, consciousness or awareness, we may need to use two languages. Uh, these could be, for example, a component of next year's uh, International Mother Language Day where students uh, highlight their global awarenesses as well as their local and cultural awarenesses. Another activity might be um, using maps. Um, it is difficult to orient to the world without having a sense of what that world is like. By using globes or maps, we can learn the names of, if not every country, at least some of them. Um, I have a number of puzzles that help um, uh, children to see the names of different continents. Or um, when I was in Uganda last year, uh, I, in fact, exactly a year ago now, I bought um, a little box and the top of the box had um, every country in Africa uh, as a puzzle piece. So these kinds of things um, help student rec students to recognize the size of the world. Um, the, uh, another way to start is to look at the country that you're, t or the language that you speak, and some of the countries related to that language, whether they're, that's an official language or uh, one of many official languages or a heritage language. Where is this language that you're teaching taught? Uh, learning about the different flags of countries and the symbolism of those flags. Those symbols also relate very much to the ethics of a global citizen. Uh, being able to understand different continents helps students uh, as they grow older to understand some of the flows of services or goods, not to mention water. Um, air um, and supplies. Um, 
And of course, you can always play Pictionary or Password to practice or reinforce this knowledge. Um, another, I think, effective activity is, is to have contact with seniors. Uh, every community in Canada has senior speakers, whether those are grandparents or people who live in a senior's home, we can all access these people. And these seniors have important stories and wisdom to share with our children and often can do so in the heritage language. What I think is important is having them share stories of less equitable times. What are some of the hardships of the past? And so that when we look at the hardships of the present, young children, young learners can come to see that we have overcome hardships in the past and who helped these seniors? Let them tell that story so that children can develop a greater um, empathy for uh, the present hardships. Such interviews also help to uh, address caring for the in environment. Um, different texts can be written about the care for the environment and eventually form um, a booklet that could be used on Mother Language Day. Learning from the wisdom of our cultures, every language that we teach within our heritage language context is rich with authors, rich with songs, rich with proverbs, with, rich in riddles, rich in stories. And what we want to do is share those in a way that helps our children learn the wisdom within our culture, the famous people who've made world contributions from that culture. And that helps to develop the pride of the heritage language and the heritage culture. Um, again, though, we can have students be addressing issues that relate um, to contemporary uh, problems such as human trafficking, hunger or poverty, and how those come from literary works of these famous authors. In other words, these are not new issues. We have throughout history encountered people who live in poverty or certainly who are less advantaged uh, or more disadvantaged. And so by bringing in the stories, we help people to help our children to see how it's been a part of our culture in the past and how it can help us learn and change the future. Uh, you could do an activity with water consumption, having students, for example, log their daily uh, water consumption over a week. They can bring that information to the school. You can graph it and then look at the amount of water that uh, actually have a lesson on water consumption. So for example, North Americans use three times as much water as Africans and yet have only one third of the population of Africa. And what does that mean? And children usually with that kind of information can look at how they've used water and ask if they could reduce it. Um, of course, there's no better time than today to look at dealing with contemporary issues such as COVID-19. Um, as we move back into a new normal, uh, we will have a, a great wealth of experience to draw upon regarding how we survived COVID-19. How was it different in homes? How was it different uh, in studying? What kind of contact were we able to have? How much did families, for example, talk about the COVID-19 crisis across the world from country to country? Did it affect anyone personally, their family or friends here in Canada or abroad? 
So there's much to talk about as well as waiting to look, it's still unknown, how as a globe we are going to both come out of COVID-19 and become better prepared for any new global crisis of health that could emerge. Um, you, we could create school contests for creative alternatives to whatever that global issue might be. Uh, other examples of global citizenship projects. Remember that they're all designed to empower your students as leaders and teachers. Uh, bring in global stories into your curriculum. I encourage people to uh, read the news uh, in different languages, you as teachers, for example, and then pick stories from the newspapers that you read or the websites that you read. Take photos, uh, put them with simple captions so your students can understand them as a way of sharing some global stories. Um, organize pen pals for your class, um, apply for grants. Well, I think money's gonna be tighter these days than it might've been in the past. Uh, take field trips, that might have to be a virtual field trip. And there are many museums that uh, around the world today that have opened their doors virtually for uh, people. Um, take time to reflect on the world around you. At the end of every, uh, every class or once a month or after you've shared a global story, take time and ask students about what their thoughts are about this or how they think this affects them. Um, volunteer and maybe we need to include actual lessons on some of those specific uh, 17 sustainable development goals. What are the benefits of global citizenship? Well, a deeper understanding of internationalization and how we're all interconnected. The building of a responsibility in the next generation for one another, for our communities, for our country, and for the globe. Uh, developing awareness and empathy for others, which means greater respect for one another, which can be as simple as a reduction or elimination of bullying because you respect your fellow uh, peer. Uh, developing ultimately stronger institutions, stronger organizations, stronger, sturdier, healthier schools and communities. The principal decision-making means developing, nurturing, respecting, building a healthier planet for all of us and developing that stronger moral compass. Making the world smaller and helping us become aware of our interconnectedness and I think ultimately a better understanding of multiculturalism.